So the, the entire momentum over the last 20 years has been in favor of more self-defense privileges, more gun ownership privileges, not less. And we can see this even after the Sandy Hook massacre, which obviously was horrific. Uh, nothing happened in terms of changing gun laws or concealed carry laws or self-defense laws, uh, nothing at all. And why do you think that is? Because I think the, the, the political will and momentum simply isn't there. Now, uh, of course, I've, I've been a member, uh, not just a lawyer, but a member of the gun community really my whole life. I started shooting competitively when I was a child. And uh, I've, I personally, uh, not in Washington, D.C., of course, because it's not uh, permitted here, uh, but in the normal course of my day, I carry a pistol for personal protection, and I have for 20, 25 years. Uh, and it's... When I first started carrying a pistol in the 1980s, uh, there were perhaps six or seven states in the country where you could get a license to carry a concealed pistol. Today, it's all 50 states has some provision for allowing people to obtain a license to carry a pistol about the day in a concealed fashion. And I think that reflects the tremendous political shift in terms of how m most Americans perceive the privileges and rights of being able to carry a firearm for protection. Or it could also show us the, uh, the power of uh, the National Rifle Association and uh, the gun industry in general. It could. I mean, the National Rifle Association, I think, has about 4 million members. Uh, there's over 300 million people in the United States. Even if we reduce that to just voting age people, the NRA is a sizable organization, but hardly uh, a majority of, uh, of the people who vote. Uh, I think if... Uh, and, of course, the NRA has been around for over 100 years, so uh, the, the notion that their, their influence suddenly exploded in the 1980s when their membership didn't explode, uh, it's difficult to, to see how that would, that would work politically. But, Andrew, y since you are carrying a gun most of the time, mm -hmm. how, in, in all these years, how many times were you in a situation where you really thought, good thing I have my Glock or whatever you're, you're, you're almost, carrying. Almost never. Uh, but the analogy I would give you is, of course, you drive an automobile, and I presume every time you get into your automobile, you wear a seatbelt, uh, or you, at home you have a fire extinguisher in case there's a fire in your kitchen. Uh, I have a fire extinguisher in my kitchen. I've had it there for 30 years, and we've never had to use it. Uh, I don't wake up in the morning and think, today is the day a fire might happen in my kitchen. It's a good thing I have that fire extinguisher with me. It's just a piece of safety equipment in case the unthinkable happens, like a seatbelt is a piece of safety equipment. You put it on, you don't expect to get into a car accident that day. Uh, and with a pistol, again, it's the law-abiding person does not get to decide when they're going to be attacked or raped or killed. That's up to the bad guy. So since you can't know when it's going to happen any more than an accidental fire or a car accident, you simply have to be prepared to, to act accordingly at all times. But unless I strangle somebody with a seatbelt, a seatbelt is not a deadly weapon, and neither is a, uh, a fire extinguisher. Sure. Uh, don't you see that there is a difference um, and that the danger is there, that people who are not as responsible as you are probably and not as well trained as you are, I mean, almost anybody uh, in this country can get a gun. Isn't that, uh, giving the number of guns that are available, isn't that a, um, a certain danger for the, for the public? That was a real concern starting in the 80s when states started to really uh, expand their concealed carry uh, program, starting with Florida in 1987 and extending now to all 50 states. Uh, so now there are many, many millions of Americans who carry a pistol every day for personal protection all around the country. And we simply have not seen these people uh, use these guns to commit crimes. Uh, it, it doesn't happen. Uh, now, keep in mind, of course, these are people who obtain a permit to carry a firearm. So they submit themselves to a background check. They have no criminal history. Uh, these are the law-abiding people in, in American society. In fact, statistically, concealed carry permit holders have a lower crime rate than police officers. Police officers commit crimes at a higher rate. Uh, so it's a hypothetical concern that if more people are carrying guns, bad things could happen as a result. But we, we just really don't see it. You mentioned statistics. There are some statistics who uh, suggest that there is a, a racial element when it comes to some of these um, uh, self-defense cases. That if you are a, a white shooter, 
your chance is higher or better uh, to claim self-defense? I, I think the data that's available is, is very inherently confounding for a number of reasons. One is that, that almost all white victims of crime are victims of white criminals. And almost all black victims of crime are victims of black, black criminals. Uh, and it has a lot to do with the demographics and where these communities tend to live. White people tend to live with white people and black people with black people. It's, uh, in many of our cities, it's still a highly segregated society. So to take a very small subset of those and just look at the white-black criminal interactions, I think you really don't end up with many data points that are useful, especially in as fact-sensitive an area as self-defense, where so much is, has to be left to judgment or perception or reasonableness. Uh, I know the Tampa Bay Times, for example, did a study in Florida where they looked at uh, how stand your ground might have applied in certain cases. Uh, but stand your ground can only ever apply if the person claiming self-defense would have had an opportunity to safely retreat from the conflict because all stand your ground does is remove that obligation to do that. Uh, many of those cases, like in the Zimmerman case, there simply was no safe avenue of retreat. That's why the Zimmerman case was not a stand your ground case. 